All right, well, good morning and welcome today. Um, hopefully you had a uh, wonderful weekend. Um, it was an extended weekend. Uh, yesterday was uh, Martin Luther King uh, Jr. Day. And so um, hopefully you took some time to uh, reflect on the importance of that day. And um, I did send out some things that you could consider uh, to uh, do yesterday or even just kind of start and uh, continue throughout the, the year um, in working uh, towards uh, the message of uh, Dr. King. And so um, practice what I preach. Um, yesterday, I did attend um, a uh, symposium uh, put out by the Minnesota History Center uh, Society, uh, and I attended a symposium called uh, Acting on Dr. King's Call. And so um, listening to some leaders in the Twin Cities and what could be um, done uh, towards uh, working on uh, Dr. King's uh, call to action. And so I found that uh, really um, interesting. And um, my daughter in high school, senior in high school, also uh, watched it with me. So it was, it was uh, refreshing to see different perspectives. So again, I continue to uh, uh, throw out there this, the, that uh, this is not something that it's just a, a one day or that it is an ongoing process. All right, um, so uh, with that, moving, uh, moving on here, looking at our agenda, today is the day uh, to uh, submit any of your missing work. And so if you um, have anything missing, formative, summative, please get that in. If uh, for some reason you can't make uh, the deadline that I have set uh, for today, um, Let's uh, be sure you reach out to me and, and let me know, and we can make out uh, some, some, some arrangements. So, so you can end this trimester 2.1 on a positive note. And uh, we have a short week ahead of us, uh, but uh, still some things that need to get done, and we do want to finish this trimester strong. Um, also this week, uh, besides not only um, – be in the end of uh, the trimester, uh, it is uh, also a deadline for registration. And so uh, hopefully in advisory today, you talk a little bit about registration, but uh, really make a concerted effort to meet that deadline uh, set for Friday, the, the 22nd. So um, you still have some time to get some questions answered. So reach out to your counselors reach out to um, your current teachers um, and ask some questions about coursework for, for next year. But you wanna be sure that you're in the driver's seat, get that registration done, okay? So uh, this week we will wrap up the unit that we have on the Second World War. And this week I wanna focus a little bit more on uh, the conflict itself. Uh, up to this point, we looked at causes uh, going from neutrality to engaging in war and, and more referencing the United States. And then you had an activity on the human impact of war, which was uh, when I look at those, when I had looked at those assignments, fantastic job, good stories. Um, I could get a sense that you understood the human impact of uh, the war, um, especially on um, uh, underrepresented uh, groups. And so um, today and this week, we will look uh, more at perhaps uh, uh, the fighting of the war. And uh, today's activity is also looking at the, uh, the atomic bomb. If I forget, and I want to just throw out there right now, is um, I did open up an enrichment activity last week. Um, and enrichment is just another way of saying extra credit. And it is uh, focusing on the American response to the Holocaust. And so I encourage you to take advantage of that opportunity uh, to explore what perhaps, you know, we in the United States may have known about uh, uh, the Holocaust, the, what is uh, the final solution, and uh, what possibly could we have done to uh, 
at least reduce the the numbers uh, uh, of victims and uh, find ways for our government and maybe some agencies to uh, um, provide some relief. Okay, so uh, we can also see here uh, for today, I have some notes and uh, I'm just gonna kind of give an overview of the practice of the war. Uh, I have a little video clip in there uh, to kind of highlight uh, the, the style of fighting uh, that will occur in the Second World War and then also uh, the activity atomic bomb. So uh, if you have any questions, remember you can always put in the chat um, or you can unmute and ask at that point. Okay. So looking at the Second World War, um, you know, again, for us in the United States, you know, our involvement in the Second World War doesn't really begin until 1941. Uh, one could argue we have been engaging in the war, maybe in an armed neutrality. Uh, the war has been going on in the Asia Pacific uh, area for, since 1937 and in Europe in 1939. So the war has been going on. Um, both Theaters of action conclusion will be 1945, not at the same time. Um, the, the war in Asia Pacific uh, will last uh, longer than the war in Europe and North Africa. All right. So when we are looking at the, the Second World War, uh, this is something that, you know, I, I had talked about with uh, my seniors this year uh, because we did a little case study on the Second World War as well. And um, when we look at the nature and the practice of this war, uh, the war uh, would use every resource available. So we sometimes look at the Second World War as a total war. Um, the industry, uh, as we saw uh, in some video clips and what you have looked at in your, your activity as well on the human impact, uh, human resources as well. Um, being used on the home front, of course, in the fighting front as well. Technology. This war is going to be a laboratory of technology here. Very innovative. And, of course, uh, probably the big innovation is uh, development of atomic weapons. And then the power of the state is greatly going to expand. And what we refer to, and I'll explain a little bit more down the road of what that means. And so, again, total war. This war, uh, a war between uh, peoples and against peoples, uh, the line between soldier and civilian was blurred. And so when we look at this war, two thirds of the victims actually uh, will be civilians. Um, so this is uh, gonna be a very costly war in that regards. Atrocities are gonna be committed by allied and Axis powers. And sometimes we, we don't wanna talk about um, atrocities by the allies because you know we're viewed as the good guys here. Um, but civilians are going to be targeted here. Again, the, the line's been blurred. You know, in Germany, you got the final solution. Uh, you know, at least six million uh, Jews are going to be um, exterminated in uh, the final solution. But then there are also other groups that can be brought into this as well. That's part of that final solution. Uh, for the Allies, the bombing of, of cities, uh, cultural cities like Dresden. Um, but then you got Hamburg and uh, Tokyo. These are just examples. And as a result of the bombings, um, firestorms are going to be created. And uh, the reasons that they can, they, they can do the bombings of these cities is as uh, the war is coming uh, in its final phase, uh, air superiority of the Axis powers is going to be replaced by the Allied powers. And so they're able to do stuff like that. And for uh, the United States here, uh, the whole issue of Japanese internment can be brought in there. And again, we can probably throw some other examples in there as well. So these are just some examples. Weaponry grew more destructive. Um, application of uh, force so when we look at air power was critical and air power in this one, you could argue uh, plays a role in determining uh, the outcome of this war. Again, dropping the two nuclear bombs, atomic bombs on Japanese cities of uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki uh, ultimately uh, is going to end uh, conflict in, in the Pacific. But, you know, there's debate 
with that, uh, could the conflict come to an end uh, without dropping those bombs? Uh, and those are that that's an issue that will be brought up uh, in that activity as well. Uh, radar, of course, and uh, transportation uh, in D-Day, uh, we will see uh, transportation of troops and the importance of, of that. And of course, the long range bombers as well. Uh, and we see that uh, occurring uh, with the bombing of uh, German cities and Japanese cities and, and in the Pacific Asia, Asia Pacific theater, as American forces got closer and closer to the island of Japan, uh, there was a strategy in picking certain islands so these long-range bombers could um, get to the island, uh, uh, the inner circle of uh, uh, the Japanese empire there. And so allied and Axis tactics and strategies transformed as the war uh, progressed, and it definitely did. Uh, and for the Axis powers early on, um, they had the success in this very quick war. For the Allies, um, it was uh, throughout the war, they would constantly meet in wartime conferences and discuss um, uh, strategies and uh, where the fronts should be and um, what the outcome possibly could look like. So it's an ongoing, ongoing process. So when we look also more at the nature of this war, uh, earlier I had, on the previous slide, I had talked about uh, the power of the state group. Well, the state of power of participating countries um, exerted control over uh, all aspects of life. And so, again, when we look at wars, how does it how does wars impact you and I? And, um, you know, again, there are just uh, uh, numerous ways in which they do that. Government coordination, whether it's for the Axis or the Allied powers, government, if it's going to fight a war like this, uh, it's going to have have its hand in every aspect of of society in the economy, making sure things are being produced. Uh, goods and services are getting to the right spots, and uh, perhaps even for us, uh, needing to uh, sacrifice and uh, ration uh, during the war. First World War is volunteer. Second World War, forget about it. It is going to be mandatory that you're going to have to do some rationing. We're all going to get little book booklets. And again, I'm just speaking of uh, the U.S. experience. It can vary in different countries as well. Um, civilian participation on the home front, as you found in the human impact of war activity, uh, many of you uh, spoke about of, of what various um, people have done and groups have done uh, on the home front. Uh, for us, you know, Allied Powers is going to recruit women and minorities to work in war factories. So there's going to be uh, demographic shifts and gender shifts here. Uh, as this war um, progresses because of where the war industries are located. But um, allied powers realize early on they're going to need all individuals participating in the conflict. Now, as we found out, it didn't necessarily mean uh, the walls of uh, discrimination and harassment uh, ceased. Uh, if anything, it, it may be highlighted and magnified it, and those would become issues down the road. For the Axis powers, they were very reluctant because in many ways they are right-leaning regimes, and they're very uh, conservative and very traditional, and they were just reluctant to use women. So instead, they're going to use um, slave labor, and you can find that, those examples in uh, Germany as well as in Japan of them using uh, slave uh, laborers uh, to uh, make sure that the war production is, is, is um, being maintained or attempt to be maintained. Um, propaganda, of course, you know, get us to think on the right um, framework. All sides are going to be doing that as well, demonizing the enemy and making sure that we are opening up our wallets and helping out uh, but through the war bond uh, campaigns, uh, making sure that maybe we're growing our own in our backyard and being careful of what we're saying. So a very effective use of propaganda. We're hearing it on the radio. We're seeing it on the, the silver screen. 
um, and we're reading it in our newspapers, in our magazines. And uh, this idea of fight for uh, national survival mentality. Um, and we will see that play out, especially in the um, uh, when we look at the Axis powers near the end, where some people are just going to fight uh, to the end and willing to sacrifice themselves instead of being in a world without um, perhaps um, Adolf Hitler or a world um, in which uh, Japan is not supreme and take it to that and take that mentality to that to that next level. So when we look at, you know, why is the Axis very successful? And again, when we, I say Axis powers, I'm referring to Germany, Japan, and Italy, just to clarify that. And they, they will have some uh, other allies, a part of it as well. Early on, they had success because of Western appeasement. They just gave in to the demands of like Adolf Hitler, Benito Mussolini, um, and uh, Imperial Japan. They had a game plan. You know, um, Japan want to create a co-prosperity sphere uh, for uh, Italy. They want to create a, a, a new Roman empire, a third Rome is sometimes referred to. And uh, Nazi Germany uh, wanted to create uh, Lebensraum, living space for uh, Germans. And so that's kind of like their game plan. And uh, they implemented it through war. And because uh, they were on the offensive right away, they're going to have war experience. And so that, that's going to play a little bit of a role here and very effective use of technology. You know, um, early on, uh, Japanese planes were uh, very, very efficient, uh, fast, very effective. Uh, and uh, that was demonstrated in the Pearl Harbor bombing. And for Germany, uh, Blitzkrieg, uh, lightning war, was very, very effective in how they used technology, air, and um, ground troops. And then uh, for Italy, you know, just who they were going up against, their technology was, was better. And psychologically, there was this, uh, because of their success um, and how quick it was happening, it had a psychological effect on people. Now, that's not to count out the allies. The allies, they're going to have some advantages here as well but it's gonna take them time. It's gonna take them time to get organized, um, especially when the United States get into it. Um, but by 1942, it's game on. Uh, Axis forces were spread out over enormous area. And so that's gonna be problematic for them, especially when it comes to the resources being depleted. Great Britain and the Soviet Union are not defeated. So that's a big oopsie by Nazi Germany and uh, their allies. And of course, Japan had not, uh, and the Soviet Union had not declared war on each other as well. Uh, so Japan isn't part of that game yet. It's not until uh, um, August of 1945, uh, realistically, the end of July, early August of 1945, the Soviet Union declared war on Japan. Soviet Union size and the U.S. industrial complex, I mean, right there, that's going to be very difficult uh, for any opposing force uh, to defeat, uh, especially our industrial complex. We are the arsenal of democracy there. And then the, the Grand Alliance, of course, um, not only is it United States, Great Britain, Soviet Union, and France, even though France was defeated, France is still fighting um, in this war. It's just a little bit harder for them. Uh, there are going to be a number of other nations a part of it. At some points, you know, you may look at a grand alliance of about 15 plus in there. And so, um, and they did, like I mentioned, meet periodically to have discussions and determine the course of action. And then in time as well, time. Uh, for the allies fighting a total war, uh, the size of their industrial complex, the size of their armed forces, resources that they have uh, is going to win out. Uh, the Axis powers could possibly fight a short war. They could not fight a long war. Okay. And so you've already heard me say that um, there are really two big theaters of action. You have uh, Europe, which also includes North Africa. Uh, and then you have the Asia Pacific. And there are a number of battles that will go on uh, in these theaters. 
for Europe and North Africa, some of the big battles um, that you probably already know, and so I'll just briefly mention them, Stalingrad and El Alamein, they're kind of turning point ones. El Alamein is in North Africa, and Stalingrad, of course, is in the Soviet Union. Uh, they represent a turning point. At that time, they may not have known that. Historians, we look back at it and go like, yep, that's a turning point. D-Day, huge uh, undertaking by the Allied forces to help open that second front in Europe and begin the liberation of uh, Europe. Uh, the Battle of the Bulge was kind of a little setback um, initially, but ultimately it was the last big offensive um, by uh, Nazi Germany against the Allies on, on the Western Front fails. And then the fall of Berlin in uh, May of 1945. So uh, the war in Europe is is done. Now, I have a video clip here, and it's about uh, the Battle of Kwajalein, and it's actually going to take place in the Asia Pacific. But I think this little battle uh, highlights the type of fighting that will occur uh, in this Second World War and would occur just about every time uh, Allied forces, American forces, are moving from island to island uh, in the Pacific. And we're going to call that island hopping. And we're, our goal is to get closer and closer to uh, Japan uh, so those bombers can uh, do their work here. Now, we're going to watch this video clip. It's not going to take that long. But um, uh, like I said, the images will highlight uh, or the action in there will highlight the type of fighting but it will also be graphic. So I uh, just want to make you aware of that too. So I will, un I will um, mute myself. Kwajalein was an interesting experience because uh, I, I feel now that it was like I would see a movie documentary. I saw the attack by our fleet, by our planes, dozens of battleships and destroyers pumping shell after shell. It seemed so overwhelming, the force that we applied to this tiny island, not more than maybe two miles each way. That was quite an overwhelming display of light. I saw the carnage and the complete devastation that I've never seen before. It was a total Total, total carnage. There was nothing left standing. It was everything was just concrete and bodies and dead palm trees. Everything was just shot to hell. There was nothing there. It was awful. All right, so there we go, Kwajalein. Um, you know, I I like showing Kwajalein because sometimes uh, when we think of the Pacific Theater, we think of Pearl Harbor, we think of Midway, we think of Coral Sea, um, think of dropping uh, Iwo Jima, the dropping of the atomic bombs, but we sometimes forget about those small little um, conflicts as well, and Kwajalein uh, fits in there. Uh, does anyone have any thoughts or reactions uh, just to that little that little clip here?
you know, that was just a small little atoll. Oh. That was just a small little atoll, uh, you know, like the guy had said, about two miles by two miles. And it just showed how the Japanese have really dug in um, on the islands that they that they had control of in that uh, it was not going to be an easy task no, ma no matter what. And um, there might have been some islands more heavily uh, defended, avoided, uh, in order to get closer and closer to um, Japan so the long-range bobbers can have a little bit more success there. Uh, again, this is, uh, uh, I believe, Kwajalein was 1944, and so uh, we're engaging in island hopping here, and uh, the United States is really having success. And so when we look at uh, the Pacific Theater, Asia Pacific Theater, here in the United States, um, that one, that theater is, is, is extremely important to us in that uh, the brunt of the fighting uh, is really on uh, the shoulders of the United States. And so uh, veteran groups really want us to make sure that we understand the importance of, of this theater of action. And so when we look at turning points. So like in Europe, in North Africa, El Alamein and Stalingrad's a turning point. Midway and Coral Sea, 1942, is a turning point in the Pacific theater. Uh, FDR had got on the radio and a and, uh, number of times and said, you know, early on, we're going to have to give up some land in order to move forward. And so early on, we did. Uh, some people don't realize that several Alaskan Aleutian Islands had been uh, taken over by uh, Japan and Alaska and Hawaii, their territories. They're not full U.S. states yet. They're in territory status but that is U.S. soil. And of course, a number of islands in the Pacific uh, is part of uh, the United States uh, territory as well. And so uh, Leyte Gulf, uh, these conflicts are important. Midway Coral Sea Leyte Gulf are very important because we're going to knock out, the United States is going to knock out uh, the aircraft carriers that are going to be very instrumental in this uh, theater of action. And so by doing that, that's going to really hurt uh, the air war of uh, Japan. And so the air supremacy uh, is going to fall uh, to the United States. And so we're going to be able to do the bombing of Japan a little bit easier because of, of that. And Japan's going to get a little bit more desperate here. Uh, Okinawa is just an, an ugly battle, um, but it's going to take a little time, but the United States will succeed there, um, as well as at the uh, Iwo Jima and the, the raising of the, the flag on top of Mount Siribachi is um, a defining iconic moment. Uh, and there's a Minnesota connection there because a uh, Minnesota boy, Charles Lindbergh Jr., not the pilot, uh, but the flamethrower is... Uh, going to be part of uh, the raising of the flag on top of Mount Siribachi. Uh, but Iwo Jima and Okinawa just show also the desperation and how um, intent the Japanese army is in, in maintaining what they've got and fighting to the end. So there's not a lot of survivors there. And then, of course, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, um, the dropping of the atomic bombs, which ultimately will, will symbolize the end of the Second World War war and open up a nuclear age. All right. So does anyone have any um, questions or uh, concerns uh, regarding to the, just uh, the brief notes that I, that I have given, I could, I could have gone on for a very long time. Okay. So uh, with that, I want you to go to, to Schoology and open up the assignment Atomic Bomb Activity. Okay. Okay. And, and so what we have here it's going to look something like uh, if you go to uh, Schoology, uh, you can find it right here. Uh, click on it. 
and it's going to look like this. So what, what it is, is going to be uh, a web quest. Uh, there are a number of things that you're going to be looking at in regards to the atomic bomb. Um, does anyone know what the name of the, the project was uh, to build the atomic bomb? Manhattan. Yeah, it was Manhattan Project. And um, if you notice, uh, first thing on the assignment here is uh, Albert Einstein's letter to FDR. And so when we talk about like uh, days that change America or events that change America, one could argue that letter that he sends to uh, FDR is going to be a game changer. So you want to see what the kind of like the, the message of that, that letter is going to be. Now, our original intent uh, for using, if we were going to use the atomic bombs, was going to be on uh, Nazi Germany. But bomb isn't, uh, hasn't been uh, completed until uh, July of 1945. And we are already gotten out of the war uh, with um, with Germany by that point. And so now, uh, once once we develop it, uh, the thought is uh, perhaps use it against um, against Japan. And um, also, you know, what can throw a little bit in there or a little bit of uh, muckiness in there is the fact that uh, FDR is going to die in April of 1945. And so you're going to get a new president, Harry Truman, who really doesn't know much about the project. He's going to have to get a crash course and um, make the ultimate decision here. So we're going to look at the development. I'm going to have you look at the development of the atomic bomb. Uh, and of course, uh, various viewpoints of it. I think we, we might think it's uh, fashionable today to discuss uh, the merits of it and whether or not uh, we should have dropped it. Um, but th these were discussions that people were having at that time, at that moment, uh, scientists and military personnel, and of course, government officials as well, were discussing the merits of it. And it really kicks in almost right after the bombs drop as well as should we have. So you wanna look at the various uh, viewpoints as well. Uh, in regards to it. And these links did work. And so hopefully they still do work. Uh, military leaders opinions of it, not all military leaders might say, uh, let's drop the nukes. Uh, so you want to take a look at that. And of course, um, Soviet Union, you know, we're, we're going to be in an ideological war after this uh, with the Soviet Union, we're going to call it the Cold War. And Soviet Union is our ally. And so you think we're, we're going to be sharing, you know, we share with the British, you know, should we be sharing with the Soviets? But um, the Soviets are going to have some views on us dropping the atomic bombs. And of course, there's going to be reactions uh, by Japanese officials by uh, dropping the atomic bomb as well, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Uh, does anyone know the, the names of the nicknames of those bombs? Gives you to think about that one still. Um, and then public opinion polls. And uh, we're talking about changing over time. So we're going to get a little bit more contemporary. And then the numbers, of course, we got to look at numbers. We always like to make uh, uh, that brings a different perspective in there as well when we look at, look at numbers. And of course, uh, the big historical question is uh, the desire to defeat Japan was the main reason for the U.S. atomic weapons by uh, the U.S. I want you to discuss that. So basically what that means is I want you to make a claim on it, agree or disagree with it, and then give some support uh, to that. Um, this, uh, this type of question uh, actually uh, would appear on uh, the IB history exam. And so, uh, So we want to uh, make sure that you are familiar with it. There we go. I had a deep pause there. 
All right, go back to my original uh, question. Does anyone know the name of uh, the bombs? Uh, one of them is called uh, Fat Man, and another one is called Little Boy. So, um, and you can, you can, uh, there we go. All right. Matthew's on top of it. All right. So uh, with that, that's, this is your assignment. We're going to work on it today. We'll work on it tomorrow. Ultimately, it is due uh, Thursday, which is the end of the trimester. Um, and uh, you can also do that enrichment activity. Um, put this one. This one has precedent over the enrichment activity. Obviously, this one's going to count for um, perhaps maybe more points, but... The idea of enrichment is extra credit. And since we weren't going to get into that particular issue of the Holocaust, um, we, we, we decided that we're going to make that one an enrichment piece. All right. Um, I will uh, keep this uh, Google Meet open. Uh, so if you have questions, I'll keep this Google Meet open. If not, uh, you are free to go and have a great day.